Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, who what can stand again? I could stand again. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God, our God is greater. Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. We give you praise and all of the honor, you are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise and all of the glory. Praising your holy name, and I sing praise, I sing praise, I give you all worthy Jesus. And I see glory falling in this place. And I see hope restored, the healing of all disease. And I sing praise. Sing praises, I give you honor, worthy Jesus. We give you praise and all of the honor, you are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise and all of the glory, God, all of the glory. your presence fill this place and let heaven come let your angels be released and let heaven come we will worship at your feet let heaven come face to face we want to meet let heaven Here, moving.
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my strength, and with all my might. For you alone, God.
ready to hear the word? Yes. We're blessed to have Susanna Lowe with us. She has a vision tailored to the needs of the Balkan region where she is from. She's a former Yugoslavian. Now she's an American. The ministry founded with her late husband, Jerry, Intentional Strategies for Transformation. Can you say IST? Can you say IST? <laughs> the ministry of IST exists to alleviate spiritual, physical, and emotional poverty. The vision of IST is realized through three priorities, prayer, working with the poor, and discipleship. For prayer, the Lowe's launched an upper room in Zagreb, Croatia, and created a place for praying where all believers can come seek the Lord and his will and experience his presence. The priority of working with the poor encompasses four main concepts, self-help, education, crisis help, and employment. Susanna's heart is to help the poor in sustainable ways that will transform lives and bring lasting change spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Discipleship is the last phase of development which encompasses the first two priorities, prayer and serving the poor. I love that, prayer and action. And this focus is practical application of the scriptures and the skills someone is gifted with by the Lord. Can we show her some love as this next video begins? I've been washed from the inside. Upper room for me is a place of tangible God's presence, a place of fellowship and prayer. And it's not only a house of prayer, for me it's uh, literally a home. Part of upper room since the first time I heard about it at New Year's Eve going into 2022. And since then, God really was able to continue His work in and through. I learned so much more about prayer, community, servitude, leadership, and things that I probably don't even realize. And being able to witness what amazing work God has been and is doing right here in Zagreb, and He actually wanting to be part of it, <laughs> that has been the greatest blessing of this season in my life. But only school. Pozdrav svima, mi smo pa, pa, Patrik i Samanta, imamo nešto reći za Aperumu, izvoli. Pa evo, Aperum je za mene mjesto slavljenja i molitve, imnosti, ali i zajedništva u duhu, u Isusu Kristu i osim što to mjesto gdje slavimo Boga, evo mjesto gdje se molitvom zauzimamo za naše gradove, za naše države, za braću i sestre, za nespašene. Eto, slava Boga na tome mjestu. My name is Fumi Lola Tomot, short Fumi. I'm from Nigeria. I came into Zagreb. House of love for me, a house of also of contacting the presence of God. For me, Upper Room is a great uh, place where people of God meet together, pray together and spend quality time together. We have guest speakers such as pastors and, and missionaries and and other people who who share their experiences uh, about their walk with God. Uh, it's amazing, you know, to celebrate, to worship Jesus and to be in prayer there. I like the uh, presence of God in this place. And uh, I'm very happy uh, because uh, I have upper room in, in my city. Upper room is an amazing place. I know it was the blood. Before I get started, um, the worship team, I don't, are you guys here? I saw the lady I was wanting to speak to just a minute ago, but I think she walked out. The, the lady that was on the microphone right here, okay. Um, yeah, the worship time was powerful Amen. and anointed. And um, I think actually I'm t wanting to talk to the lady that was reading the scriptures, that was the vocalist. She was sitting right over here a minute ago. Um, wow, just felt such an anointing on her. And I just wanted to give, give her a word of encouragement. I don't know. If, I guess they're getting her. Um, I just really want to encourage you to continue to grow in worship. 
the presence of God comes when you worship. You know, the, the word says that he inhabits the praises of his people. And, and his presence comes when we worship him. Yeah, I just, as you were worshiping, I mean, you read the scripture, there was just such an anointing on you. The gentleness, but powerful presence of God. And I just wanted to encourage you, just felt like the Lord said, you know, he sees your humility. Um, but there is such a passion in you that you have yet to recognize and let forth. Don't be afraid. God sees you and wants to use you. Yeah. Powerful, powerful uh, worship. Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Pastor Allen and leadership team for allowing me to come and, and speak to the congregation today. I've been really looking forward to this time and, and just really excited to be here. It has been a little bit since I've been here, so uh, really, really glad that this worked out for me to be able to come. Um, the first video that you saw was just a snapshot of a, a, a simple day or night in the life of our community. Uh, we have a, a group of young people that love to go to the streets about two to three times a week. Whether it's sub-zero temperatures or whatever it is, they are out there with their microphones preaching the gospel. They are uh, sp speaking to people that are, that are lost. Um, they're praying for needs. It's just powerful to see their passion. And so I, I thought you would enjoy that. The second video was just a few of them sharing what Upper Room Zagreb means to them. And so um, I wanted to share that. They put that video together. It's kind of amateur, but I thought it would be cool to share that with you. And so hope you, hope you enjoy that. Well, I want to present to you Trapped in America. Um, this is an autobiography of my late husband, Jerry, who... Um, uh, wrote this book. Actually, the Lord spoke to him three years prior to his diagnosis to start writing this book. And um, truthfully, publishing Jerry's autobiography has been just a sacrificial labor of love for me in the most trying season of my life. Jerry's simple yet profound life and love for God permeated everything that he did. And so I hope that you will, if you have not already read it, that you will... Um, obtain it. I do have a few copies in the foyer. Um, read it and let it challenge your life and, and hopefully it will impact you. To my great astonishment, the book is sold out and we've had to order another thousand copies. I know it's just, I never, I really never thought that this would, it would go this far. And so we actually, two weeks ago, started translation into Croatian. Uh, and so it is really, really amazing, and, and I just am, am uh, elated as what, what God is doing with the book. I do have, like I said, a few more copies, so they are in the foyer, and afterwards I'll be happy to sign a copy for you uh, for, um, uh, if you'd like to obtain one. Well, as I was praying about what I should share with you today, I felt like the Lord said, simply share your journey and the blessings and the challenges of the path to your destiny. And so, you know, God has a destiny and a plan for every believer. He has a purpose for every, everyone's life. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. And then he goes on to say, to give you a future and a hope. Your calling will look very different than mine. But... You have a purpose. And God has placed giftings and talents inside of you and desires, even in your mother's womb, that will help you fulfill that destiny. For Jerry and I, this was the nations. Matthew 28, 19, I think everybody knows this verse. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, God does not pick the way we would pick. <laughs> you know, he can find the most unlikely candidate, and I'm a living proof of this. I was born in communist Eastern Europe, in a country that no longer exists, in a small, insignificant town, to a very poor parents 
as the 11th child. I grew up with outdoor, without indoor plumbing, with um, dirt floors and an outhouse. I remember one semester I had to share shoes with my sister and we would alternate who wore the shoes to school. Yet in God's kingdom, you do not have to fit the most likely to succeed profile, right? Thank God. <laughs> I was around 10 years old when walking to school, I had an incredible encounter with God. Now, I didn't know what was happening to me at that time. I had no language for it. But I felt like the presence of God walked with me to school. And it was really like the finger of God marked me in this time. Now, it wasn't actually until I was 18 years old when I first time heard the message of salvation. And I actually, actually accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And, of course, my life has never been the same again. Um, I believe that it was the hand of God that I met and married my husband, Jerry, a missionary from Texas. Yeah. <laughs> God had a perfect plan, you see, to um, cultivating and developing a, his character in me and also developing this uncultivated gift of leadership that he placed on my life. And this plan for my life for him, from him was to pluck me out of my little bitty town in Eastern Europe and drop me off in the middle of corporate America for 25 years. Now, some of my friends in my hometown thought that sounded like a fairy tale. Well, let me assure you, there was much struggle. <laughs> Trying to raise a young family and um, a new career in a foreign land. All the meanwhile, thinking, Lord, when, when will we go back to the Balkans? Some of you are carrying promises of God in your life. And you may be discouraged today, thinking, maybe I missed him. You know, the weeks or the months and years are passing by, and you think, did God forget? Or did I miss it? Did I imagine it? Or did he find somebody else? I really believe the Lord wants me to tell you today, he sees you. You're exactly where you need to be. He has not forgotten you. Allow him to continue to work in you. You know, Joseph waited 13 years to see his, his promise fulfilled. Moses waited 40 years. Whew. <laughs> we waited 25 years. God is faithful to complete the work that he has begun in you. As long as he continues to have your yes, you will see your destiny fulfilled. Don't give up. So what does a journey like this look like? I would love to tell you that we had angelic visitations and we had a voice behind us. This is the way, walk ye in it. But in reality, much of the 25 years, God was silent. You know, sometimes we felt like we were pressed into decisions, like moving to, the, to, to America as the Balkan Wars were beginning to brew. Uh, you know, our thank God for wise leadership, our, our church, Shady Grove in Grand Prairie, Texas, they were like, um, you know... This doesn't sound like a good place to be for an American with a young family right now. Why don't you all come back for a while? <laughs> and we really didn't want to come. But thank God that we listened and, and obeyed our leadership. Uh, some of the decisions we made during the 25 years, we made the wrong decisions. And we had to bear the consequences of those decisions. We had to learn from them and, and, and work through them. God had to forge his character in us. You see, the callings and giftings of God are free and they are irrevocable, according to Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. But character, now that has to be forged in us and it takes time. It takes time to develop that. A few years into us living in America, and three babies later, 
I had just received my first promotion to management in my job. And so I was beginning to assimilate into this culture, you know, and I was, you know, I'd gotten promoted, so I thought, oh, good, I can make it in this country, you know. They see potential in me. I got promoted, you know. And I was enjoying my job. I was loving it and, and really wasn't thinking about the Balkans quite as much. I was, but not as much as before. Then at a worship conference at Shetty Grove, I had an incredible, powerful encounter with God. I don't know if some of you remember those worship conferences when the whole place would be just in holy silence laying before the Lord. It was one of those times. As I lay before the Lord, I heard a very clear voice that said, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their misery. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is actually from Acts 7.34. The voice was so loud that I literally looked up to see if there was anybody on the microphone speaking. Of course, that's when I realized that nobody was on, everybody was on the floor. I think Dave Holsinger was under the piano, <laughs> you know. It was, I knew that God has come to meet with me. And I immediately knew that my Egypt was the Balkans. In this, during this encounter, God told me that actually I was at a critical juncture in my life and that this promotion that I just received that I was about to step into was actually God sending me into boot camp and that my job was to be a training ground for ministry. He said the time was not yet, but he wanted to make sure that this calling was etched on my heart as well. You see... I've embraced this calling as our calling when I married Jerry, but it has never been personalized to me. But in this moment, God etched it on my heart. And so I got up from that place with a renewed focus, and I knew I leaned into every challenge at work, I, every leadership class, every developmental class, I was there. I read every Patrick Lencioni and John Maxwell book on leadership that I could get my hands on. And for the next 20 years, I received promotion after promotion, and the favor of the Lord was on my life. Yet the longing to return to the Balkans never left. It actually got stronger. There were many tears. Lord, how long? When will you send us back? When in 2010, we received a prophetic word that in three years, we will be living in the Balkans. And we thought, how in the world? But God began to open doors very rapidly. I want to read Genesis eleven thirty one here. And Tyra took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they set out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. You see, Tyra set out to his promised land of Canaan, but for whatever reason, he settled in Haran. Now, why did he settle in Haran? We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But verses, verse 32 tells us that Tyra died in Haran and never entered into his destiny. There may be some of you here today that God began to, God showed you a destiny and you, you took off and you began to go in that direction. But you got stuck in Haran. And for whatever reason, this morning, as you're hearing my voice, you are sitting in Haran. I really think that the Lord is speaking to some of you. So just listen. <laughs> Let him talk to you. You see, holding on to the promises of God takes one level of faith and determination. But let me tell you, it takes a whole different level of faith and, and motivation and and 
and per, uh, persistence to step into the promised land, to, to your destiny. Do you know what the biggest enemy of the best thing is? It is not the worst thing. The biggest enemy is the good thing. You know why? Because so many settle for the good thing and never press in to realize God's best for their life. For us, in the practical, we had to um, raise funds, graduate our youngest daughter from high school, set her up in college. We had to liquidate our possessions, sell our home, find a new home in Zagreb, on and on. This time was exciting, but fear also came knocking on the door. What if our children needed us? You know, they were young adults. They were not moving with us. Um, I had to give up my lucrative executive salary by this time, and I had, we had to start living on faith. What if our supporters forget about us once we've been there for six months or a year and they just forget to send support? <laughs> um, yeah, we had obstacles to overcome. And many of those were right here in our minds. We had to overcome them. But we knew that this was our Kairos moment, and it was now or never. We had to press in and, and, and step into this, uh, this calling. Many times, missionaries, um, and this could be translated to any, I believe, any destiny, really. You know, you press through, you're going through the process of, of all the preparations, all the challenges, all the obstacles, you overcome those. And then you think, okay, good, here we are. Now we are at the doorstep of, of this thing that we've been praying for. And for us, it was, the, it was the nations, yes? So we're on the plane heading over there. And, you know, it could be easy to say, okay, good. Well, we've done all the hard part. Here, re revival, here it comes. We are arriving to a mission field. Well, it's not exactly like that. <laughs> Actually, it's not like that at all. <laughs> it was more like, um, it was more like to, in 2015, uh, yeah, sorry, 2013, three years after the word was given to us, when um, we landed in Zagreb, like the enemy got a hold of our flight itinerary and waited for us at the airport. And so the, mo the day we landed, Jerry became deathly ill. Prior to that, no health history, no, no uh, you know, he was very healthy. He, became, he had congestive heart failure. He was diagnosed with con congestive heart failure. And uh, we, for the next several months, fought for his very life. One week after we landed, my mother passed away. Uh, during the process of our transition, the enemy went after our children. And even to this day, we are dealing with some of those consequences. You see, destiny can come with a heavy price. But I would do it all over again. And there are victories, too, amidst the battle. Six months after Jerry was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, God sovereignly and miraculously healed him. It is today a documented miracle in the hospital in Zagreb. Yes. Amen. Let's worship Jesus for that. Now, in 2015, the Lord directed us to make a shift in our ministry. He told us to start a house of prayer, get on our knees, and start praying and interceding and bringing the presence of God into the Balkans, into Croatia, and into Zagreb. In the beginning, we had a lot of pushback. Um, you know, as we shared in the, in the monthly um, citywide leaders and pastors meeting that we were going to start a house of prayer, uh, they weren't as excited about it as we thought they would be. They were questioning, is the house of prayer even biblical? I thought, I don't know. I mean, is it biblical to pray, you know? <laughs> but we were so thankful for the 25 years that God built his character in us because we were able to bow low and humbly 
continue to pray and bless those very leaders that criticize us. We would pray for them and bless them regularly. Take care to not allow offense to settle in your heart. Yeah, it's very, very important. And you know, we kept lifting high the name of Jesus. We kept praying year after year for the Balkans, for Croatia, for Zagreb. Now God is forged, I mean, I'm sorry, gold is forged in fire. Jerry and, v, and, v, and me were very different. Those that know us probably could attest to that. Often it was said of our marriage that we were polar opposites. And real, in reality, we really didn't have much in common other than God and the Balkans. And really, the Balkans, as I said earlier, came for me after we were married. So... Um, as you can imagine, we had to work through a lot of challenges. <laughs> Not only because we were so different, but because we came from two different cultures. We came from two different con continents, and with the age gap, we came from two different generations. So truly, God put us together. <laughs> there are several things that can be listed as a key to a successful marriage, but I just wanna mention two to you that really helped us in our 35 years of marriage. One, divorce was never an option, period. That's it. Number two, I submitted to my husband, but we also submitted to one another. We learned to honor each other's giftings, to recognize and honor. So when, I, when there was a situation that my giftings were called for, then Jerry learned to trust my leadership and allowed me to take the lead. Whenever a gifting or a situation appeared that Jerry's giftings needed to come forward, then I took a step back and allowed Jerry to take the lead. And it was like an ebb and flow. And this really, I believe, is what made our marriage and our ministry successful. Now, in my view, all of the training, all of the preparation, blood, sweat, and tears are not worth much unless you finish well. And I just want to say, some of you here may be facing some shift in your life, maybe on your job or in a volunteer position or whatever that may be. Take care to finish well, because it is not about how you start. What's important is how you finish. Amen. Amen. In 2020, my sweet husband was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a fatal disease that um, paralyzes and actually severs the <clears throat> communication between the brain and the nervous system. So Jerry became fully paralyzed, unable to swallow, speak, breathe, or move. Yet his mind was, was fully functioning until the end. My ministry became Jerry. I wanted to care for him as if he was Jesus himself. The marriage vow took on a, a better and for worse, took on a whole new meaning. And during the, just the long days and nights of suffering, he was very present with us. And Jerry passed into eternity 16 months ago. So you might be wondering, what about the ministry or the destiny? Well, Psalms 127, verse 1, describes this perfectly. Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. We laid our ministry down on the altar. And we asked the Lord to burn up everything that we have built, but to sustain and preserve that which he has built. Amen. And remarkably, God kept the fire burning on the altar at the upper room in Zagreb. And I, amen, amen. And I have to tell you today that there is a river bursting forth in Zagreb. 
an army of, of young believers, men and women, who, like King David, declare, I will be even more undignified than this for my king. The fire that these young people have, I have never seen in the Balkans. <coughs> it is truly remarkable. What God is doing in Zagreb with these young people is holy and sovereign. It has nothing to do with any of us. In fact, I feel like it's a full-time job for me to keep my fingers off of it. <laughs> because, you know, it's so easy for us to try to put God in a box. And structure him. You know, it's, yeah, it's so easy for us. We've gotten so structured that we've left no room for the Holy Spirit. And I see this generation looking for something authentic. They want something real. You know, my guys there in Zagreb, they're reading the book of Acts, and they're saying, we want to experience this. And not only the signs, wonders, and miracles, that too, but they are yearning to experience the ecclesia, that life and love of community that, the, the, that we read in the book of Acts. And that kind of a community takes no credit all the credit goes to the Holy Spirit. There, it is a nameless and faceless um, move of God is what they're looking for. And I believe I see that everywhere I go, not just in Zagreb. As I reflect on my journey towards my destiny, I am thankful for the, for the victories. But I am most thankful for the hard times and for the challenges. You know why? Because growth happens in the valley, not on the mountaintop. I'm so thankful that we made the hard choices and did not get stuck in Haran. As we come to a close, I want to ask you, are you willing to pay the price? In fact, I believe Holy Spirit is asking, will you, like Tyra, become complacent and comfortable in Haran and settle for the good? Or are you going to step into your purpose? Yes. Brothers and sisters, we are living in times when we are no longer able to sit out on the sidelines. Amen. It is time to be all in. We can no longer play Sunday morning Christianity. And you know, if you find yourself this morning feeling like you're stuck, well, just repent, get back in the game and say, here I am, I'm signing back up again. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't know what your calling is, what your purpose is, but I know this one thing. You are a key component of God's purposes for your family, for your church right here, for, for your city in Granbury, for your nation of the United States, and for the kingdom of God globally. Amen. So I really just want to leave you with the challenge. Will you sign back up? Amen.